Good evening, everyone, and thanks very much for tuning into this evening fireside chat session at the uh, EHFG 2021, organized by the European Health Forum Gastein, of course, in conjunction with the World Health Summit and the European Health Union Initiative. Obviously, because we're virtual, we are not sitting next to uh, a chimney and uh, a literal fireside, but we hope we can bring across some of the informal atmosphere uh, that one usually has on such occasions. My name is Ilona Kickbush and I'm the founding director and chair of the Global Health Center at the Graduate Institute for International and Development Studies in Geneva and I'm also the Vice President of the European Health Forum, Gastein. And I'm really, really delighted to be joined in this fireside chat by Chikwe Ihekriazu, who was recently appointed Assistant Director General of Health Emergency Intelligence at WHO headquarters in Geneva. And he will have a dual role. So uh, he will also be the head of the new WHO hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence, which was recently on the 1st of September inaugurated in Berlin by uh, Chancellor Merkel and Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization. So welcome Chikwe uh, to this fireside chat. We last met in Berlin uh, at the opening and it's lovely to see you again. For those of you who don't know about the European Health Union Initiative that is also supporting this fireside chat, I just want to remind you that it champions a greater role for the European Union in health, in health across Europe, as well as on the global stage and calls on European leaders to develop a global health policy alongside the UN and its specialized agencies especially in support of a strengthened World Health Organization. But what can more European responsibility in global health look like concretely? And what will it take for Europe to prove itself a true ally of the global South in the joint fight against global disease threats in the future? We are all still looking for answers on that. And there is the question if trust can be rebuilt in the wake of the dearth of solidarity that we have seen during COVID-19 vaccine distribution. Very important questions that we will look throughout uh, the forum in Gastein to try and answer that. So while Chikwe and I discuss some dimensions of uh, these topics, you can also give us your opinions by answering the polling questions in Slido uh, to your right. So we hope we will get a lot of answers there too. So Chikwe, after this introduction, let's begin. First of all, on a more personal note, uh, you have uh, a very interesting background with a family career and upbringing spanning continents actually the UK, South Africa, Germany, and Nigeria. And uh, how has this intercultural experience shaped who you are? And how has it influenced your career choices? Tell us a little bit about that. Thanks, you know, uh, firstly, thanks for having me. And uh, I hope we can share some thoughts. And secondly, to your point, uh, I, I, yes, I've had those experiences, but I can't claim any credit for them. The, I was born into a family, uh, of parents from two continents and from very early on in my childhood, because we it, it was born in Germany, moved to Nigeria in my early years, my formative years were all in Nigeria, but I came to Germany fairly often. And, you know, you were very early exposed to two radically extreme differences in the world and uh, asked those questions. And by asking questions, on why you know the experience of life in two countries, two continents as a child were so radically different from each other, you started forming answers from very early on. And I think the most important thing for me was realizing that um, there are different worldviews because I sat with those different worldviews every single day. My parents very often had different views on how the world should be, right? And 
and but I think that's it's not the difference that matters really. It's accepting that there are differences and we can still live with them and have a, a joyful, loving family like I had while still living with those differences in worldview. So I, I think that's been the most important thing that has then shaped the way I think and look at problems. And by instinct, I always am not only focused on my perception of the world because I'm very conscious of my biases. Right, and I'm always thinking, what is the other person thinking? What are the other people's points of view on the whatever the issue is that we are addressing at that point in time? And I think that's what's kind of helped me a little bit navigate and adapt to these different contexts where I've then spent a few years of my life. Thanks for that, Chikri, and I can relate to it very much uh, because, uh, as you might know, I grew up part of my life in India. And I can see how much that influenced me. And definitely, I'm very sure it's one of the reasons I turned to the international jobs that I took on. So uh, how do you think it influenced your career and the choices you made there? So, you know, when I, when I left Nigeria after medical school as an adult now to start um, um, you know, uh, a master's in public health in Dusseldorf at the Heinrich Heine University in, in Dusseldorf. And, you know, and we started confronting some of the very tough questions about the world we live in. And then I started reflecting at that point, you know, I had stumbled into public health. I, I still, you know, I, I studied clinical medicine and most of us that do that, you know, I really focused on uh, providing care to the patient in front of you. And, and even when I started this master's, it was with an intention, listen, I'll get some postgraduate education and I go back to my <laughs> uh, clinical uh, work. But, you know, I got fascinated that, you know, the, in, 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 in medicine, generally, clinically, prior to the MPH, you know, you were asked a question, you either knew it or not, you are either right or wrong, right? And, and got into public health and realized that there was hardly a right answer to a question. There were different approaches to, to solve issues. There are different approaches to finance health services. There's uh, social insurance, tax insurance, health. You know, so there are always different approaches to problems. And, and in my home, I had a mother that was focused on the arts and develop a career in that area and the father that was a doctor, right? And I thought public health brought the strengths of those two influences nicely together uh, to where you are allowed to think, you're allowed to have various opinions about a way to move forward, but still, um, you know, based on a certain scientific principle that allowed you to still bring in the strength of uh, the basis of a lot of the work we do in medicine. So I think that that uh, evolution of my personal experience to uh, entry into public health and discovering uh, how many big problems are yet unsolved, doing that in Germany, but always having at the back of my mind uh, the health situation that we had. And I remember presenting to my course mates some of the challenges and some of the issues that we had in Nigeria. And, you know, none of them had had the experience of managing a child with cholera and things like that. And, and so there was a really interesting dynamic in, the, in my public health uh, class in Dusseldorf because I learned, I feel I learned as much from them that in fact they learned from me because our experiences prior to the course were so radically uh, different. And in a way, that again is Dusseldorf is not the most natural destination for people looking for a public health degree in global health, right? Um, in, in the German context, most people will go to Heidelberg, for instance. But, um, you know, Dusseldorf was, had a more European uh, approach to its delivery. And that made it an even more fulfilling experience for me because I then learned a lot more about health and public health in the European context. And I already had a fairly good understanding of 
uh, the context in Nigeria and on the African continent. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm sort of reminded that, you know, I grew up, uh, my father was a diplomat and my response was, I will never be a diplomat. And then after a while, after I joined WHO, I described to my mother what my job at the WHO was. And she said, and you told me you would never be a diplomat. Uh, so uh, she realized straight away the kind of challenges that come uh, particularly with global health and, uh, and global public health. That leads me to uh, a question that uh, did you ever think, you know, as you went through your career, medical, public health, pandemic preparedness, etc., that uh, the world would be faced with the kind of global COVID-19 crises we had? I mean, we in the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board said it was round the corner, it was coming. How did you feel about that? Do you, you feel, know, uh, you know, I need to be ready? It's, it's somewhere in between. You know, I often use, I don't know if you remember that headline on Time magazine about the impending pandemic. I often used it when I was going to do uh, lectures, right? But I never quite believed that we would have anything as bad as what we've experienced. And, you know, I, I lived through and I was very active in the response to the H1N1 uh, pandemic. When I was working in the UK, I was as involved as I am today, just not in a leadership position. And, you know, I remember how it started and then with it out. And I always kind of felt um, it was plausible because we knew it was from what we know and our understanding of infectious diseases but sometimes he wondered whether, you know, the advancement in, in how humans lived, the, you know, advanced societies was no longer that we had evolved sufficiently uh, for enough natural barriers to be in place for a single uh, virus to have the impact that we've just gone through. So in, in a way, tragically, uh, I was wrong. I think many people were um, as much, and, and we must learn lessons from this, that as bad as this is right now, as bad as close to 5 million deaths are, um, it can be still a lot worse. And we still are not in a position. Um, we, it's, you know, we, we, the, the odds are that we will still face worse pandemics. And, we have got to learn from that and adapt and really evolve our tools a, mo a lot more rapidly than we have up to now. Yeah, many people say, of course, even though that's hard, you know, to transmit that uh, we were actually lucky that it was this kind of virus and that we we're given the chance to practice and to be ready uh, for something much more transmissible, something much more dangerous. Now, you yourself mentioned, you know, about being in a leadership position or not. And uh, we talk a lot about uh, health leadership in uh, the context of the European Health Union, but also in the context of Gastein. And so I was wondering, you know, what do you think uh, was most important uh, for leadership uh, within the COVID crises? And perhaps an additional issue around that, uh, did some unexpected leaders emerge? You know, we always look at existing leaders and how they reacted. And often, you know, there's leaders that emerge elsewhere that didn't really get the attention or that one didn't expect to emerge. <laughs> so, Ilona, you're not known for easy questions, so I should have... <laughs> I shouldn't complain. I, I think in terms of um, what, what skill I think or what attribute was most important in the beginning and in fact through the outbreak is that very often as leaders you're expected to provide answers, right? And um, many of us fall into that trap ourselves of trying to provide clear answers where there's no clarity. And have difficulty expressing uncertainty and sometimes not just difficulty lack the humility of of expressing uncertainty and i i, I if i reflect on this pandemic I, I think the people that have gained the most confidence 
among populations that leaders that were able to articulate at, at some point that there was uncertainty about their own knowledge, about the future, about what people had to do, but still did it in a way to uh, mobilize enough people behind them to take the action they needed to take at that point in time. Uh, I think most people that had so much certainty about the future, what would happen or what wouldn't happen, really fell into traps over and over again. And uh, I think that's an important attribute there that I have reflected on a lot. And it's not easy because you're put under pressure very often by political leaders, by the media, by everyone to provide answers uh, on a subject that you should know or people assume that you, you should have answers to. So um, to your second question, um, you know, I, I, I don't know whether one person stood out, but um, generally for me is, there were many people in our context that because we didn't have access to a lot of support for all sorts of reasons, um, there was a lot of internally generated momentum that delivered on, on things that I, I would never have assumed would have been, they would have been able to do. And, and this is at levels of the organization and in our context that probably we would not have given that responsibility if we are not put in the tight spot. So whether this is around uh, suddenly developing a supply chain plan to deliver uh, PPEs across the country, managing it, uh, warehousing, distribution, accountability, and all that goes with it, or the fact that uh, we had to deliver information on the pandemic every single night and we're still doing that, right now as someone, a group of people had to take responsibility for generating the data and making sure it happened. So, Ilona, I, I think rather than one or two examples of individuals, I, I think almost for a, an organization to work uh, requires leadership at, at so many different levels, right? But those things don't happen in a crisis. They emerge in a crisis because you have allow them to develop in quote unquote peacetime. Because if you've never allowed people to make, to take responsibility, make mistakes, learn from it and keep on going, then they would not take that responsibility when there's a crisis because they'll be too afraid uh, that the consequences will destroy them completely. So, you know, I think if I reflect, I think so many, so many leaders have emerged in, at levels that are not recognized, they don't have the opportunity that I am having now on sitting on with you and, ha and having this chat, um, but they make things happen and they have enabled this response to happen in the Nigerian context. And I'm sure the same has happened in many other countries and many other uh, contexts around the world in the last two years. Yeah, I really am intrigued by that answer because, you know, in the COVID-19 debate, this word uh, in German, at least, system relevant, you know, who is relevant for the system uh, became a word that was used very frequently and was, you know, applied to a whole number of people, bus drivers and people at uh, supermarket checkouts and everything. But of course, also within uh, public health systems, etc., there are so many invisible people that actually keep the system running and that uh, took up you know the new challenges just as you described and i think one area and maybe you can share a little bit more about that how you handled that in nigeria the whole area of communications became so incredibly important and uh, i wonder if uh, there are examples you can share with us how you know, building up a communication that can be trusted or doing something to counteract information uh, that uh, actually led people to believe that uh, certain measures were not uh, uh, acceptable or uh, that science could not be believed in. Are there examples uh, from either Nigeria or other parts of Africa you could highlight? 
Um, you know, I think that communication bit, the first thing is to say, actually, we, in NCC, we have taken that responsibility very seriously for a while, right? But we were criticized a lot for it uh, in the past, right? I, I, we thought that, listen, communicating to people and winning their trust is so important that it has to be elevated uh, in stature in the organization. Uh, but mostly these are in many of in many other organizations in Nigeria, these are people at the bottom of the food chain that don't really have any uh, responsibility of, uh, you know, in that, in that light. So in, in this case, what, what happened very early on? And I remember one Saturday morning uh, when things got a little bit, you know, at the beginning when things were getting worse and, you know, we, we called together our team, but brought together a lot of other partners that were supporting and thought, listen, um, what do we do, right? So what we did was, and this wasn't out of any strategy, this was out of desperation. We set up a crisis comms team, um, decided on that morning in about an hour, uh, a tagline uh, to, uh, that said, take responsibility, right? So I, I think from the very beginning, we we realized that we couldn't be seen and perceived as a, what the UK calls a nanny state, right? That's a, that if if we and we neither, neither did we have the capacity, uh, or in in a way in Nigeria government generally, and this may be the same in so many other countries, but there's a trust deficit often between uh, government and the yeah. people. And I think we, we had a big uh, a situation in Nigeria that that was definitely the case. So we knew that we couldn't be perceived uh, to be telling people what to do all the time. So we started that very early. I mean, that became the norm a lot later for in many other contexts. But if you look at when we started that Take Responsibility campaign in Nigeria and brought in uh, people in the arts and music, our film uh, Nollywood heroes to take that and communicate it and own it uh, to the public, then gained us a bit of uh, credibility. Of course, there were some risks. Uh, in, uh, in Nigeria, there was a lady that uh, led on a, a campaign around that. And then a, a few weeks later, she herself was seen holding a birthday party uh, with uh, obviously a lot of people in the room and you know the anger of Nigeria was transferred to NCDC because she was seen to be a champion of something that we were um, wanted to deliver but she herself was not adhering to those principles. So it's a tricky space but um, I, I definitely think it can no longer we can't be snobbish around our responsibility uh, to communicate to people anymore if we were in the past. And this is as important as surveillance, as uh, laboratory diagnosis, if a public health agency or a Ministry of Health is not taking uh, communication or risk communication seriously, then there's a big deficit in its delivery of, of its role. Yeah, I think that's one very, very important lesson from COVID-19. And, you know, as a political scientist, I've also been looking at uh, research done by other political scientists on the whole issue. And it turns out, at least some of the first studies show that there is, you know, two things that make the difference. One is the establishment of trust, uh, governments and public health agencies that were able to do that. And the other was, as they called it, for example, in Denmark, radical transparency. And that relates to the earlier point that you made about communicating uncertainty and explaining properly, you know, when you change your strategy because you know more about the virus and uh, you know, have learned from other countries. Now, Chikwe, you built uh, uh, and uh, uh, transformed, as many people say, the Nigerian Center for Disease Control to be, you know, uh, a really uh, strong organization. And uh, now you've been asked to come to the World Health Organization to be Assistant Director General there and to be Director of uh, the new WHO hub on pandemic and epidemic intelligence. Uh, you've alluded to it already a little bit, but sort of what lessons from uh, 
your leadership at the Nigeria Center, are you going to take uh, to building uh, the hub in Berlin? Um, so obviously, first of all, these are completely, two for completely different levels of responsibility, but there, there are a few similarities that I'm, I, I think the first thing is to, to recognize that there are many opportunities um, to support the work that we're doing, we're going to do in Berlin, um, that, that we need to first recognize, identify, and bring on board. Um, so what I, what, one experience that I had in Nigeria was uh, there's, there was a lot of capacity in the country that had never been activated for whatever reason. Uh, sometimes political, sometimes it's not the right person in the right place. Uh, and that will not be immediately obvious until you look for them. Um, so there's a lot of redundant capacity that needed activation and we worked very hard to do that. And the, once, this sense is, once they started working, getting the fulfillment that comes with delivery, uh, it became almost a self-fulfilling cycle, uh, progressive positive cycle because People worked, wrote their first papers, got published, got rewarded, got recognized, started feeling what, experiencing what success felt like. And then at some point, and I don't quite know when it was, there was a tipping point and things started happening on their own. That, that's one experience. The, the second is Nigeria, like Germany, is a, it's a federal republic, right? Um, no matter the strength of your ideas or the conviction of your ways, you still have to convince 36 plus one other federal states in Nigeria to, to go with you in this direction. I can't order them in most things relating to health. We had to convince them. Sometimes they're sticks, sometimes they're carrots, sometimes they're mix. Um, and, and some of them don't agree, basically, that the direction you're proposing um, is the right way to go. So, um, and in a way, that's how the world is. We've got to accept that the, we live in a multipolar world. As much as we celebrate the opportunity and recognize the responsibility that WHO has, I, I am also aware that not everyone is completely bought into this, but we've got to win them over by but with different things, by delivering, by working with them, by acknowledging their point of view and slowly finding a way to move forward. So I wouldn't at this point alone tell you that, you know, X scale is directly transferable to that. And unlike in the hub, I also don't have executive leadership the way I had in Nigeria. The WHO is a very big, important, organization uh, uh, with a leader uh, who has a specific vision and I have agreed to work with him because I buy into his vision uh, and there are structures in the organization that we will align with and work with. But at the same time, the hub gives us an opportunity to try a few things, do a few things differently, innovate uh, and really see whether we can um, attract the best people, the best minds in the world to help us uh, to deal with a problem um, that we agree. The one thing that excites me and the reason why there are all these other initiatives popping up around the world is, I think there's a consensus that there is a problem, right? And people are looking for different solutions. So that consensus at least that there's a problem and an opportunity to solve it through this type of platform gives me hope that we can find a way of linking them together to deliver on uh, what we've been asked to do. Thank you for that. And maybe just for our audience, uh, the way uh, this hub is structured is that it is an integral part of the World Health Organization, an integral part of WHO's emergency program, WHE, and uh, therefore uh, the interlinkage uh, between, for example, the Director General of the WHO, the head of the WHE program, Mike Ryan, that uh, uh, many of you know from many of uh, the statements uh, on COVID-19 
so those interlinkages are absolutely critical. So the hub is not a standalone institution, but an integral part of WHO. Uh, still, Chikwe, there have been critical voices saying, oh gosh, you know, another such structure in the global north. Uh, and uh, how is that going to help the global south? Uh, I know that WHO has reached out widely to its regional offices and country offices, two countries during the virtual World Health Assembly. But uh, could you say a little bit about your vision about this outreach and the kind of cooperation that should be developed? No, thanks, you know, and I think that's such an important question, you know, and I almost feel that no matter where this hub would have been placed, there would have always been some disagreement to the location. So I'm not too bothered about the location, but I will be um, uh, intentional in working with colleagues to build a human resource landscape in the hub that reflects the world that we live in, right? Because uh, we have to build out the people, the work that we do, the people that are doing the work and the people that we serve to be representative of of the world that we live in. And I think if we do that, if we're intentional about that from the very beginning and uh, do that, build up uh, uh, an operation where every country in the world recognizes the value that we are adding to them, one way or the other. And, and, and that needs to come out in our narrative and in how we engage. Uh, and so that we're not seen as this kind of um, some analytic hub somewhere, sit, guys sitting in front of computers looking at data. But we've got to really demonstrate that whatever we're doing adds value to the decisions country leaders, political leaders will have to make, not just within the metro, but in countries, to face the infectious disease threats that we know they will be facing over the next few years. So. Um, there, there will, and I hope that uh, in a way my uh, being there demonstrates and gives confidence to um, you know, many people from this part of the world or from other parts of the world that the work that we will do will definitely be focused on solving problems, not only uh, at the top of the pyramid, but at the bottom of the chain that through which we need to generate the evidence to make the decisions that we have to make. Thank you. Uh, we had a discussion yesterday with the leader of the uh, WHE at uh, WHO, and he made a very, very strong point about uh, the need to develop a new approach to surveillance and to have you know, a new view of public health in the 21st century. When we launched the hub in Berlin, the term collaborative intelligence was used a lot. Uh, where do you think, see the need for uh, revisiting how we have done surveillance, how we understand surveillance? What needs to be different? And what sort of collaborative intelligence, uh, what role does that play there? Yeah, so uh, thanks, Ilona. You know, I think this word is so important and so powerful, this term, in the world that we're looking at. It really starts not even at the hub level, it starts from the work that we're all doing in our little boxes. So if I think about the, the institution I work in at the moment, that similar National Public Health Institute, historically, we were dependent and we, we insisted on being dependent on only data that had been generated uh, from within the system in healthcare providers and hospitals that is officially transmitted through official means uh, up a food chain to the point where a decision is made. And sometimes it was so bad that even when it was obvious, imagine that there's a fire burning and you can see the fire and you say, listen, I will not react to that fire until it is reported up to me <laughs> through the official reporting chain. And, and in a way, that's how public health has worked historically. Um, so over the last few years, there have been various initiatives that, has, that, has challenged, that have challenged that and have tried to use 
non-traditional data, non-traditional information uh, to enable decisions to be made. But somehow it hasn't gathered the strategic importance and relevance that it should. And we, in fact, that we need uh, to make important decisions. So in a way, I, I, I don't think, to be honest, that we are going to reinvent the wheel. I think that a lot of the information, the systems, the opportunities that we need already exist, uh, even in countries and beyond countries, and sometimes even in collaborations within countries, in networks of certain groups of countries. So the first thing is to see how we can leverage and pull together some of these things in order to then make sense of it. And hopefully in the future, then be more strategic in terms of how we build them out, support them, advocate for them and use them uh, to make decisions. So in a way, it is in summary, moving out from our traditional fixed way of uh, thinking and working into um, a more design thinking approach to how we work with uh, the data that we need to make decisions. So I, I don't know if that, I've had many challenges explaining this term, collaborative intelligence and what it could mean because we have to define its meaning over the next year and give it the solidity to enable people buy into it, understand it, and ultimately use it. Yes, and of course, as was discussed at the inaugural session, the interdisciplinarity is Absolutely. so important Absolutely. because just as you indicated, Absolutely. you know, that uh, new types of people were becoming critical, we noticed that new types of data were becoming critical. And uh, that bringing that together is, of course, also an, an enormous challenge. Now to a really uh, sort of um, difficult question, I think perhaps uh, that uh, relates to uh, the uh, relationship between the global north, or in this case, maybe we do say specifically Europe uh, and uh, the global south uh, in relation to what we have experienced over the last 18 months. And Gordon Brown, for example, recently said, and I quote him, Europe's neo-colonial approach to global health uh, is something that is no longer tenable. And uh, what is the perception of the European role in global health, the European, let's say, behavior in relation to uh, global solidarity in Africa, if one can answer in such a general way? So, tough question. I, I think we'll agree, and I think most people here would agree that there have been um, there have been episodes in, our, in the history of global health and the relationship to Africa that is embedded in our colonial history that is not the most pleasant, right? And uh, there are things that um, we can't possibly be proud of. The the challenge, the biggest challenge, I think is that we kind of thought that all of that was in the past and we live in a more egalitarian, supportive world today. And some of those things couldn't ever happen again. And um, in a way, when you look at the facts are that the, if you look at the vaccine, access to things like the vaccine at the moment, just doesn't paint the world in the best of pictures. And um, in this case, it's almost a case that, um, you know, it's not even in the best interest of those that have had the most access to the vaccines to, uh, to be in the situation that we are at the moment. So on the other hand, there has been a lot of good that's happened in the last few years, right? Um, a lot of, money has been invested in, in health and healthcare on the African continent. Um, and a lot of good has come out of that. Um, but I think if we get to a more philosophical way of thinking, really that um, one that we really educate everyone 
citizens in Europe as well as in Africa, that fundamentally every life has equal value, right? Uh, and that's something that sometimes is difficult um, to communicate for leaders to communicate because you are elected by a set of people in a in a country where you live or you are political leadership. And nobody in Nigeria is going to vote for a leader in Belgium or in Germany. Uh, and therefore, many of those your initial decisions are based on short or medium term political. Uh, calculations, no matter how they're clouded. So I, I think we have a joint responsibility here, both in, in Europe and on the continent, to um, convince uh, ourselves that there is a different way. And if, if we can actually allow this different way to work, that there's not only health value in it, there's also political value in it. And, um, you know, it, it will be difficult to get there, but I, I do hope we can start making um, some, you know, small steps in that direction. And I, I've seen leaders, um, uh, Chancellor Merkel is one, and, and I admire that a lot, who have made hard decisions in her political career that really had no short-term benef political benefits for her. But I think in 10, 20 years, when we look back at her leadership of Germany, uh, there are very significant decisions that she made for which she took a fair bit of beating within the German political landscape, but that will really define her legacy as a, an incredibly important leader for the world as well as for Germany. And, and, but sometimes I, I admit it is hard to make those hard choices and uh, Chancellor Merkel probably made them because of many reasons that um, that still make her stand out as an incredibly important leader for her generation. Thank you and it might be interesting for our audience that uh, on occasion of the inauguration of the WHO hub Dr. Tedros gave a, a special WHO medal to Chancellor Merkel for her commitment to global health and the many initiatives she took, for example, to put global health on the agenda of the G20 and the G7, something really, really important now in the context of COVID-19 uh, and particularly the discussions around uh, financing of global health, for example, and financing of the COVID response. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, let me ask you this way around, our European Health Union Initiative uh, is advocating for a global health strategy of the European Union. It actually had one about 10, 12 years ago, and then that disappeared into the mists of time. Now, if uh, the uh, European Commission were to say, yes, let's embark on writing a global health strategy. And uh, Ursula von der Leyen said, Chikwe, come and tell me what are the three to five priorities I must consider in such a strategy? What would you advise her? Uh, um, you know, firstly, I'd advise her not to use anyone that had written any of the previous strategies. Uh, I'm so, out then, okay. <laughs> no, I, I don't know the details of any of the previous strategies, but I, I think it always started from a wrong premise that help is needed somewhere in the world and we are in a position to offer that help. We'll do this strategy sitting in Brussels or wherever we sit and, you know, deliver a strategy, fund that strategy, give uh, conditions on which we transfer resources, uh, come down and measure the conditions that we have given and uh, define whether th that has succeeded or not. And if we continue working in that way, we will end up with the results that we've always had, right? So I, I think if we, if we really want to think about the global health strategy in the real terms of what it means, then there has to be a fundamental change in how strategies are, are done, right? Um, in, in public health terms, because we do say that um, 
health outcomes are long term. We realize that uh, measurements are difficult. We, we know these things because we teach them to ourselves in every public health class that we deliver. The only thing is that when it comes to actually <laughs> delivering the strategies, we do exactly the things we say should not be done, right? So I, I do think that there's an opportunity that um, we have come to this point of an opportunity through a very difficult pandemic. And if this pandemic in itself doesn't um, change our way of thinking of how interconnected we are, um, then nothing will, right? Um, no one would have thought, I mean, you would have, no one would have imagined the burden of morbidity and mortality that has been carried, that has been the burden of the West in this pandemic, right? And it's incredibly unfortunate. Um, so something has to come out of this that we've got to really, if, because I believe Ilona, if we, if we think that we're really jointly susceptible uh, and vulnerable to these risks, then we will not act in the context of nation states because it won't make any sense. But we've continued to act in that context while saying in public that, you know, all the right things. So I really hope that when this new strategy is designed, defined, that some of the lessons from this outbreak will shape how we think about our, our joint vulnerability and our joint responsibility for the future. And once that's the case, then we'll ask the right questions and we'll ultimately get the right answers and the right approach to move forward. Thank you. And uh, you actually point to what some of us consider the weakness of the previous strategy, that it was rather a classic development strategy, in quotes, even though some of us argued against that at the time. And uh, maybe that was one of the reasons also it was not uh, uh, sustainable because uh, uh, of so many other things that happened then and it was not part of the development uh, consensus that was uh, that was then developed at another point in time. So that global responsibility is uh, something that the European Commission puts forward regularly and uh, there's been a new focus on the cooperation between the European Union and the African Union, also in areas of uh, uh, global health, particularly public health. I'm also thinking of the African Centers for Disease Control. But could you uh, share with us some of the priorities you think should be further developed in that Europe-Africa uh, strategy and cooperation? So, you know, in terms of specific areas, what, what are really, um, in addition to some of the short-term goals, is really see a, an effort around the developmental side of things, right? And, and one of the things I'm really very excited about is some of the initiatives now around manufacturing of vaccines on the continent, right? Recognizing that the current situation is not in anyone's best interest. But in a way, um, what I'm in that specific regard worried about that it will focus too much, and I, I don't have the details, so these are assumptions I, I admit, on the manufacturing side, that success will be defined by the building and running of a manufacturing plant somewhere on the continent. And, and I hope that behind that, there's a, a more an effort towards sustained capacity development uh, that really allows an open transfer of skills and knowledge and science and an enthusiasm for science that can then enable us uh, and support us in our aspirations to develop the expertise that we need to be real partners in, in global health, right? And I, I think it's in our common best interest if that is enabled to happen. I, I won't shy away from it. We are far from where we need to be to 
produce at the moment the, um, the scientists that we need to fully engage in this space. But there is nothing intrinsically wrong with us that prevents us from doing so, right? The African scientists thriving all over the world where the context enables yeah. that to happen. So how can we support, uh, work with countries in Africa through whatever mechanism to enable that context to develop a little bit faster than it would have if we allowed it to just grow organically? Because it is growing. It's just that the challenges that the world is facing is escalating at a pace probably more, uh, more rapidly than would enable us to catch up with the skills to develop the skills that we need. So, but that space has almost become um, a dirty word. You, you, you almost are not allowed to write into any proposal something about capacity development because it, no one wants to fund it because you can't measure it. It's too fluffy. And you know everyone wants to count how many antiretrovirals you have delivered in a month. So I, I hope that in, in, in this strategy, there's really a focus on uh, finding some space uh, to uh, enable us or support us in our aspirations. Uh, when I say our, I mean in Africa to develop the skills, expertise and knowledge that we need to be real partners and participants in our own uh, future. Thank you. And uh, I do understand that this part of capacity building is also one of the roles that the hub wants to play. And uh, with your perspectives on that, I think uh, that will move forward in a very interesting way. We've nearly reached the end of our fireside chat. The logs are glimmering and uh, the fire is turning down. Uh, but I'd like to end with uh, another personal question because uh, with your responsibilities, of course, uh, you have been you know, through a, a big crisis. You've had to work around the clock then WHO comes and says, you know, would you come and join us? You've had to uh, round up things uh, in Nigeria. You've already had to start thinking about Berlin and WHO. So how do you take care of yourself? How do you avoid, I mean, you can't avoid stress, I guess, but how do you avoid burnout? What helps you keep sane and enjoy life? Um, okay, tough question, but I, I think there are two things I'll say, right? You know that. To, to be honest, for and for for me, and I don't know what the experience of others are. You know, I I, I get a lot of I'm on your on your program. We get a lot of exposure, but none of this is possible without an incredible team that works very often unrecognized, unsung that run around and make things happen behind the scenes, right? So I think that to, to, to even attempt to do the type of work that we, we do, we need, we need a team that believes in the vision, your vision, and therefore are ready to go over and beyond. And there are many people that have done that in NCDC for the past five years. But the, the second thing, and sometimes maybe even more important is, I have had the unconditional support of my family, right? And um, in the last two years, it's been particularly hard because there have been, you know, the, 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 the number of hours we've had the opportunity of spending in a normal family time has been sometimes completely non-existent. But not only have they supported, they've recognized that how important this work was and and therefore never question never complain and just said listen that uh, uh you know you you have a job to do and that has allowed me the mental space and not not feeling guilty not feeling you know that i'm taking something away from them to be able to work and i think if if if, if you've got if you have the privilege of a great team and also a supportive family then you can manage to find the time to do some of this. And I'm very privileged to have both, to have had both in the last few years. 
thank you for this answer. And uh, I do think it is a big privilege. And uh, I must say it's, uh, it's an experience that I've also had that without such support, there is, uh, you're really left alone. And uh, it would be very, very hard to deal with such situations. Chikwe, it's been a joy to discuss with you. Uh, thank you for giving the time because uh, talking about how you manage time, thank you for managing to uh, speak with us. Uh, I hope uh, the audience has enjoyed it as much as I have. And uh, we thank you all for watching and you know, continue to watch out for Chikwe as he takes on his new responsibilities. You're going to see and hear more of him. Also, I hope at the European Health Forum Gastein 2022. And uh, we wish all of you a very good evening and we hope you enjoy the rest of the European Health Forum Gastein this year. Goodbye, goodbye Chikwe again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Elona, and good night, everyone.